hope and healing from the other side. Welcome to Messages of Hope with Suzanne Giesman. Listen, they're all around you, close as a thought or a memory. Messages of Hope. Messages of Hi, everybody. We have a big crowd gathered. Thank you for joining us today. And those of you who aren't with us live, thank you for watching, tuning in. You're going to love this conversation probably because you'll feel the love going back and forth between me and my guest. I just love her to pieces. Dr. Connie Mariano, former White House doctor, is here to talk to us, not so much about her career, but we have to talk about that, but really about the transition she's gone through in her life after the transition of her beloved husband, John, who was a friend of mine and of Ty's. So we're just going to have a nice friendly chat, but you're going to learn some things about what Connie calls the journey from we to me. Should be fascinating. Let's bring her on now. Dr. Connie, thank you for being with us. Thanks, Suzanne. It's a great honor and joy to be on your show. Well, you had me on your show a while back in the studio with uh, Voice America. We'll talk about that later as well. But I have to uh, zero in on you here for a minute. And look, look, everybody, look what's in the background there. She has this great model. My she airplane. Has, yeah, Air Force <laughs> One. There you go. Air Force One and Marine One, the helicopter that the president's in. I know you've flown on that, both of those aircraft more than a few times. I am in the frequent flyer program back then for after nine years at the White House. And I think you flew. Didn't you fly on Marine One or Air Force One? Air, I flew on Air Force One. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but you you definitely were the frequent flyer. I'm, I want to bring up one slide real quick before I, I don't want to forget to do this. Let me see, where are they, where are they? Right here. No, wrong slides, hang on. <laughs> Give me a second. We're gonna remove those. I have to bring up your book. I was all ready and then it went off. Hang on, that's the one there. Here is Dr. Connie Mariano on her book. I had to make a slide because Connie, I can't find your book. It's buried in my bookshelf somewhere, but I've read it twice. White House thank Doctor you. is just the greatest read. And I thank you for writing it. <laughs> it was yeah. a joy to write. It was after nine years of the White House to share that journey. And I'm actually writing my second book finally after 14 years. And it's about my widow's journey after losing John in 2019. Well, we, we definitely will be chatting about that today. But I wanted to start by saying that uh, you and I did not know each other when we were both on active duty in the Navy. Connie is a retired Navy Admiral with some firsts under her belt. We'll talk about that in a minute. But you were actually the White House doctor when I was aide to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And you and I, in chatting, figured out that on President Bush's inauguration day, you and I must have been within literally feet or yards of each other at the Capitol building during the inauguration. We probably crossed and just have, didn't notice. We were so caught up in our our, our mission, our duty. That's right. that's right, our respective missions that day. So the, these firsts that you achieved, would you share that with everybody? Because you're just such an impressive lady. I, I'm very blessed. This country has given me so many opportunities. I was the first military woman to be a physician to the President of the United States. I was the first woman director of the White House Medical Unit. And probably the biggest honor coming from a Navy enlisted family was I was the first rear admiral of Filipino descent to become a, an admiral in the U.S. Navy. So I've been very blessed by everything this country has offered me. Well, you earned all of it, certainly. It's just uh, what a beautiful career. And I really encourage uh, all of you to get a copy of White House Doctor. It's, it's a wonderful insider's view of the White House and the whole military uh, part of it that that's fascinating and you, you're a great storyteller. How many years were you? Nine years. I was the end of Bush Senior, all of Clinton, and it was a very boring time, nothing happened. And then W for about six months, so. You say boring time, but isn't that really what you want? No, it was not. It was far from boring. There was never a dull moment. There was never a dull moment. No, well, just happily, uh, Nobody passed on your watch, right? Thank God. That's oh. every White House doctor's wish. Nobody dies on my watch. Yeah. But unfortunately, your husband has passed. Uh, we had, 
the great honor of getting to know John. When I, I have, I'm going to bring up a picture because I do have a picture here. Uh, let me find the next one. Here we go. I'll make this one a little bigger with a different view. Here we go. So this is uh, me and Ty, but here's Connie with John. The very first dinner we enjoyed together, and we had quite a few after that. This, I believe, was during the first trip when I came to Phoenix. You this were living in Scottsdale at the time. I think you spoke at Unity. I did. That's what I wanted to bring up. You came, you, you yeah. came to an event where I channeled my guide right. Samaya at Unity. And I knew you were going to be in the audience. And I was a little, uh, little uncomfortable. This was years ago when I still wasn't as ease, at ease with channeling as I am now. And much to my surprise, when somebody in the question asked my guides a question about Jesus, Jesus stepped in and I channeled him. And when it was all over, everybody was just a Twitter that was just like, oh my gosh, that was wonderful. And all I could think was, oh my gosh, there was a retired Navy Admiral in the audience and a Catholic priest. What did they think? I, I think Jesus outranks both of us. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. But I believe you, I remember you saying it was one of the most sacred experiences of your life. So that, that changed everything for me. Isn't it funny? At the time where I was on my spiritual journey, I needed that validation. Yeah. But we then have enjoyed several meals with you and I just value our friendship. But I wanted to say that John came to me for a reading. And I think that was a real blessing because I don't know, I'd like to know from you what his belief system about the afterlife was before the reading. He is a very, he's very cynical. Um, I, I've always been is, interested in astrologers, psychics and mediums ever since I was a little girl. One of the things I talk about in my White House doctor book before I got interviewed at the White House is I said a little prayer and I said, dear God, show me a sign if this job is meant to be. And I walked into the interview and I saw a sign. I go, I'm getting this job. Oh, but John was traditionally raised uh, Judeo-Christian, Protestant, you know, but he was always searching. He had gone to India several times and meditated. He was seeking something. And when we met, I talked about psychics, astrologers, mediums, and actually it was an, a psychic who predicted I would meet someone like him. And the number 315, a lot of numbers. She said the number 315 was prominent. This was like, I'd known him for about four to five years before we ever considered dating. And she said, this guy, the number 315 is prominent. And I didn't realize till a few months later when I went to see him in Indiana, the tail number on his airplane was 315. <laughs> I knew I, I got the goosebumps even before you said it. Yes, <laughs> But he yeah. would tell me, he said, why do you believe in that stuff with mediums and psychics? He said, I thought you were a woman of science. And I said, I am, but this is beyond science. This is amazing. Nice answer. Yeah. yeah. Wow. And I remember his reading was profound. I won't go into any details, but uh, did he accept that? I called him because I know there was a waiting list for you to read. And you did it as a favor because he took you up in his glider because Ty got airsick. And I figured, why would a ship driver get airsick? I mean, his- Well, he didn't throw up, but both it was the but heat and the bumpiness. Yeah, the thermals. So he took you up and you did a GoPro and you had such a blast. You, I was in clinic that day. I was here in clinic seeing patients. And John was so excited. He said- Suzanne had a great time. There you are. You That's had such a blast. The pictures on the banner on my yeah. homepage. Now everybody yeah, knows. It was great I time. Was in the glider with Connie's husband, John, as the pilot. <laughs> <laughs> so you weren't afraid. Yeah. You weren't afraid. And so you were so generous and said, I'll do a reading for you. And he's like, oh, no, 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 no. He said, no, no, no. I do, I, there's a, I'm good. There's a waiting list. <laughs> And so I said, you got to do this. People are lined up to, to do it. So the next day when he went over to your, your trailer and you read from him and Ty took the dogs for a walk, I was here in the office. And then I called him afterwards. I go, how'd it go? And on the phone, Suzanne, he started crying. He started crying. Oh. He said, there's no way she would have known about my dad or what my life is like. There's no way. And there were evidential mediums of which you are will tell you specific things that only that person and the one who have passed know about intimately. 
that nobody could have Googled or made up or read the mind. And he was totally convinced. And he sent the, uh, the tape to his older sister in Canada. And she listened to your voice and the intonation. She said, without a doubt, that was our father coming through. Yeah, it was profound. And the healing was, I could tell that the messages, healing took place on both sides. I just want to say for the record, I don't think I ever say to anybody, I'm good. Like you said, <laughs> but I, I know I would have said to him, I can, get, I can get good evidence. Don't We give right. all credit to spirit, regardless, however. So he took both Ty and I up in the, in the, uh, in the glider. And it was really surprising, Connie, because we, both of us thought glider is going to be quiet and ethereal and just smooth. And we both got nauseous. Nobody threw up, but it was hot and noisy from the wind buffeting and then the bumpiness from the thermals, like you said. So it wasn't what we expected, but we trusted John because he is a master glider pilot. Yeah. 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 So why don't you tell people what happened? You know, he died doing what he loved to do. He died in the Nationals competition in Nephi, Utah, July 1, 2019. Flying a glider. Yeah, flying a glider. He had come in first two days before. Two days prior to his, his crash, he was the number one pilot out of, out of 65. And I used to ask him, why do you do this sport? Do you get money? Do you get any awards? He goes, no, we get bragging rights. So he got in front of... They, they did the final score that day and he got in front of all the pilots in the, in the hangar and he got to do his speech. And something in me said, you better tape this. And I taped it and, and I, you know, a few weeks later played it as celebration of life. But he got up there and he was so on a high, he was so happy. And then two days later, um, after he came in first, it was July 1, he, he I was supposed to fly back to see patients and I helped, helped him launch. And all the planes are lined up like an aircraft carrier, right? And the mm -hmm. tow plane's coming in to tow them off. And he was one of the first to launch. He and somebody else were in his plane. And my typical ritual as a good glider wife, that we call glider widow, glider wife widow, is I help prepare him. I look him up in there, I crew for him, I get the wings covered, I take care of it, and I help him with his oxygen and his parachute. And our typical ritual before he launches is as a Tow plane's coming in. I put my hand on his shoulder. I check him. I look at him and I say to him, this is always a way I say this, come back home safe to me. Hmm. And then I kiss him on the lip and he says, I will. And then as I shut the canopy, it felt like I was, it was bizarre, Suzanne. I like closing a casket. I'm shutting the canopy down like this. Now you haven't shared this with me before. Did you, did you have that feeling at the time? Yeah. I just Only that time? It. Only As that. I replay it, it was just sort of eerie because I tried to block it. So what what made that even more so was as as the plane as the the rope was towed to the nose of the glider, he typically as he rolls down the runway, he turns to me on the sidelines and waves and blows a kiss. He did not do it this time. This is the only time he didn't do it. He looked straight ahead, like on a carrier. You're looking straight ahead. He didn't look back, and I thought, oh my gosh, he's just really focused. Yeah. So then I got in my in the truck and I was going to go do some errands in town. So I'm driving through the airfield and I see all the glider trailers are long and they've got that little fin with the tail number. And you know what vision came to my mind when I was looking at those fins and those, you know, on top of those trailers? Tombstones. There are tombstones. It was Whoa. there were tombstones with you know their call signs. And I thought, what what the heck is that? Huh. Yeah. It's almost like you, you know, but you, you sort of put well, that off. So many examples of the soul knowing that that was going to happen. And uh, yeah. our contract was ending. Wow. Yeah. Hmm. Amazing. We always so, remember, widows remember what happened and how they were told. You know, I'm a doctor. I, for 41 years, you know, I, I dealt with death for 41 years. And the sad reality is all my patients will die one day. I can't save a single one, right? Well, I have a I have a veterinarian friend, Beth, who said life is one hundred percent fatal. At least this, <laughs> this incarnation. Anyway, that's the point of today. It's this incarnation. Yeah, yeah. But it's so I know death pretty well. Um, I just try not to. I try to keep them on this side of the veil as much as possible. But it's how you look at the other side and how they see towards the end. And that there's nothing like 
loss of a loved one to catch your attention. That is, you asked me, was this the hardest thing I've ever done? Absolutely. The hardest thing that I've ever had to deal with in my whole life. Because it is, it is so much a part of you and your soul and your identity. And it is, it is life changing. And I'll be honest, there are times I was happy to die. You know, it was in the, right after he died, we hit COVID and isolated. And I said, you know, I thought if I got COVID and died, it wouldn't be so bad. I would, I could be with him. I don't want to be here in this life. I know that is a very, very normal reaction. Yeah. But what kept you here? You know, I knew that if I did something to lose, leave this life, he would be very angry at me. He would say, what the heck are you doing up here? You got work to do, go back there. But I also realized my children and my grandchildren and my friends, and I also realized I still have work to do. I'm not supposed to leave yet. I can help, I can still help people. You know, I can still make a difference in this life. And I used to, and I say now, you know, may my pain be somebody's gain. And I see that with widows where, where I've lost somebody I loved. And there, I was quoting statistics, there are 1 million new widows in this country every year. There are 11.3, about 12 million widows, 3 million widowers. John were here, he'd say, well, men die first because they can. <laughs> but, you know, I look at my women patients, you know, my practice, and they say we're married women, 75% of married women in this country will be widows one day. It's, I always say it's the club that most of us never wanted to join, never had plans of joining that club. But here we are. What do we do? We are. Right? And there's John with his glider showing, uh, showing what, what he called the mast of shame. It's the reason I agreed to go <laughs> up in that glider, because he had this little button he could push and a little propeller came up if you needed it, if you got in trouble. Right. So yeah. you, you believe that he had a medical emergency and that's why he crashed. You know what? I don't think so. There, the autopsy was clean. He, there was no stroke. Oh, I, thought NTSB, you, I thought I remembered you saying that. NTSB did the investigation. Results came out about two years later. They think they always, you know, pilot error. They think a wingtip clipped a tree because he had been circling in that can, and they call it sink. The plane is sinking, and I think he was trying to land it. He landed it hard. He didn't slam into the mountain. He landed it hard. He transected his aorta, which is a fast way to go. I, I talked to the coroner afterwards. And he went very, very quickly, which to me was wonderful. That's, if you're going to go, he, he always told me he never wanted to die of dementia or heart disease or cancer. He didn't want to die of the things that my patients die from. He says, I don't want to do that. I'll never do that to you. He died doing what he loved to do. He did. I, I've done a reading for you since he passed. I don't remember any of it, but I know you've been to you've been to more than one read medium. You have some great medium friends. I'm blessed. Well, shortly after he the day he died, I text you. I text my psychic in New Jersey who actually predicted him dying. Oh uh, she just said he would die before seventy. Well, it was a year later. And so I text all my friends. I text. I remember them. that text. I was visiting my sister for July 4th weekend. Mm -hmm. And I got that text and it was just shocking. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then you called me from Oregon. You're in your RV and you said, check your email because John came through. Oh, a drop in. But interesting, around that time, I was back at my house in Desert Mountain. My friend, best friend, Maddie, who's like my sister, spent the night with me because I'd just gotten back and we we're making the arrangements to the funeral home. So she said, oh, I don't want you alone in that house. But she spent the night in my house, in the other side of the house, in the guest room. And in the middle of the night, she said, I woke up and I could see John everywhere. Because I had told him, yeah, she saw, I said, well, that's the visitation. She could see him and she doesn't, you know, she wasn't into any of this. And she said, I swear, I wasn't afraid. I can see him smiling throughout the room. Now, she wasn't in this, but she's the one that came with you to my retreat in North Carolina. Last yes, week. yeah, she loved it. So she all in now? Oh, yeah, she totally embraced it. In fact, we uh, we went to see uh, another medium in New Mexico, not New Mexico, Cherry Creek, um, who I, who's read for me twice and was on March 15th. So Maddie and some friends and I, and it was, he. John comes through loud and clear. There is no change. What I find interesting is the things he has predicted are coming true, which mm -hmm. I was, he's very much in my life. 
And uh, don't you all love it, everybody who's watching or listening now, when we hear about people who were skeptical mm -hmm. and they just, I'm not going to believe that. And where's the science? And now they're talking to us from the other side. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. When I do readings and the spirits show me this motion with their hands and it means my eyes have been open. Here I am. I'm talking to you. I can't deny it. I still exist. Definitely and it's specific not, yeah. things. It was, you know, I have had four or five mediums read for me. And so I, I never give them background. And one of the first ones in Carefree said, he's telling me that you were so right about energy and the other side. <laughs> You're so right about it. Good. And specific things. Again, nobody could make it up. It's, it's, it's like your readings, right? You know you're with the right source because you couldn't have made this up. Yeah. Any gold nuggets from, from anybody that just, we love the stories things he's gotten through to you besides that one which is great you know i call them kisses from heaven and i i keep a file of kisses from heaven they're numbers music sounds but a couple times i've dreamt about him uh after he died the first couple of dreams i would wake up crying and i i couldn't you know because you're vibrating so low but the the ones that stick out i've written out what he said the first dream he came through was we're in our plane our tbm and I'm flying it. I'm, we're taxiing on the one way because we our happy times are in our airplanes. And he's in my seat and the co-pilot and I'm in his seat. But you I, don't fly, do you? No. So I'm this just, is the dream. I'm the emergency landing person, which God yeah. forbid I never want to do. So I'm taxiing on the runway. And he looks at me in this dream and those beautiful blue eyes. And he points to me, says, no matter what happens, keep flying the plane. Don't quit. And I just, yeah, I rewrote that down and it came right around the time of COVID and at the time of me thinking I should just retire, not work anymore, not see patients. And he said, no, keep flying the plane. And it comes through loud and clear. You know, it was a message from him. You're not going to give this up. You're going to keep working. And it got me through COVID and it gave me the purpose to keep going on because what would I do? You got to do things that's of service. Wow. And, uh, you know, it's interesting how widows run into other widows. We're almost like widow magnets. That That's a God thing right there. Yeah. 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 Or children, who, people have lost their children. I run into family, parents who've lost their babies. You know, I try to connect them with your parents, helping parents heal organization mm -hmm. and yeah. other groups that, in fact, I'm going to a fundraiser tomorrow for a friend whose little two-year-old granddaughter passed suddenly around the time John died. And um, they're fundraising for sudden un un undiagnosed infant deaths, why these babies die. And I don't know of any pain as, as severe as losing a child. I mean, they have a, the term widow and widower, but you, there's no term for a parent who loses your child. Oh, but you're... there is, Connie. Well, what is it? What oh, yeah. It? And by the way, I'm sorry I was distracted there. When you said it, it comes in loud and clear, I heard, but you aren't, Suzanne. And I looked down and my microphone was sitting way across the, oh, my gosh. the table. So maybe I'm a little more clear now. But okay. <laughs> um, so, no, so we realized the only term for parents who had lost I hate that word lost. I don't, I don't like to use that word. Uh, mm -hmm. Who have a, parent, a childhood transition was bereaved parent, which is so depressing. Yeah, and I realized that as I have a stepdaughter, Susan, who passed while on active duty, we're called gold star parents if you look oh. at a child. So I, we, uh, we, at Helping Parents Heal, put our heads together and I asked Spirit and I was given the name Shining Light Parents. And Helping Parents Heal has adopted it. They're copywriting it or whatever, trademarking it. But it's it's a very positive term. Our kids across Shining. the veil are always our shining lights. And as we come to know what you know, yeah. that those who pass are still guiding us, still part of our lives, then our light, light turns back up again and we become shining lights for others. So I like that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and it's one of those things like nobody knows what a gold star parent is until you educate them. So through podcasts like this and every other effort we make, we're letting people know you are a shining light parent. So you have... Uh, two radio shows. I'll bring up a little banner here with okay. voiceamerica.com, not voice of America, voiceamerica.com, two shows, House Calls and Widow's Walk. Would you tell us about those? Well, the House Calls is now in its eighth season and you were wonderful to have graced one of my earlier shows. 
And actually, I think I got the largest volume of listeners when you were on my show. Huh. You were thinking of doing your show afterwards. So you were an amazing guest. You opened up a lot of uh, people's minds and hearts to what we call woo-woo. And we talk about woo-woo. Yeah. I know, it's not funny? I'll sit in my office here and I'll talk to somebody who lost a loved one. And I'll lean forward and I said, I know it sounds woo-woo. You know, the quote's woo-woo. Mm -hmm. um, but has your husband or wife come through to you? And there's nobody in the room. It's just the two of us. Like we have to like quietly whisper, like someone's going to say we're crazy. And they will usually say, you know, it's weird. I, I saw a butterfly or his song came on when I was crying or some, or I can smell his scent or I dreamt about him and, or something that out of the blue reminded me. And I thought, that's it. And I think cynics will say, oh, that's a coincidence. But you know what? If it brought you comfort and joy and peace, what's what's why is that a problem? I don't have to put you on Lexapro or antidepressants or Ativan or Xanax. I mean, you can uh, definitely. I'm all for bereavement therapy, but if you can get comfort and some peace from that, why is that harmful? That is. Oh, oh, I thought you were meaning you're not going to say they're crazy. I don't know my medication, so I thought you were oh. naming medications <laughs> like we're going to sedate you because you're yeah. talking woo woo. No, but you're saying that. You're telling them that acknowledging and honoring those signs sure. takes can take the place of an antidepressant. And there are people who will benefit from anxiety and antidepressants, you know, and I, I wouldn't detract it from there. But a lot of people really shouldn't, don't do well on them. And if they can find comfort in other ways, and they'll do it in meditation and prayer. But I don't see any harm with, with you know, I will tell them, I said, have you ever connected with a medium? And I'll just be up front. And Lana, well, you, you do it? And I think I think uh, when people see somebody of authority, they go, as John would say, you're a woman of science. I said, well, why not? And I talked to my medicine, my, my traditionally trained medical friends, and they're fascinated. And then I said, who do you want to come through? And they go, well, my grandfather, my grandmother. I said, when and if you are ready, let me know. I'd be happy to introduce you to somebody. That's all. You never force them. And they're fascinated. They're just fascinating. That's the thing. And it until we open up to the joy of realizing we can connect with those who have passed and guides and angels, we don't want to talk about it because we're so worried what other people will think about us. Mm -hmm. When that doesn't matter to the soul at all. The soul wants us to know we are connected. So mm -hmm. this is part of the reason why so many people are attracted to my work is because of that you know, left brain, you were a military officer. Now here you are, military admiral and doctor and embracing this and allowing other people to embrace it. I, I just can't wait until this is, mediumship is accepted among the masses because it's nothing but healing. It's coming. I'm working on some TV series things and books. And I think the more lives and souls, the more souls you touch, the more that I can touch, that you catch people's attention it becomes more acceptable for people, right? Right. You know. Well, you said you said when I sent out the email blast to my email list about this show today, you said, "Well, I guess this is really my coming out party for the, <laughs> the woo woo." And we do we do laugh about woo woo. It's just an acknowledgement that that some people they they look down at it, but I think it's an endearing term. Actually, I love my woo woo friends. <laughs> I have a shirt among my friends, embrace the woo-woo. Or the quote that I give my friends when I go, I have a place in Sedona, it, it goes like this. I went from boo-hoo to woo-hoo through woo-woo, who knew? No kidding. Yeah. Well, remember we were in Sedona and we saw the Navy? It's all these interesting things that pop up, these messages. What Navy thing? Remember we were coming back from your conference. It just struck me that, that we were crossing the, the road near Talakapake, going back to my place. And there was one car that stopped. And I said, look, Suzanne, the license plate oh, had no. Navy on it. That's it. It was just Navy. And here are the I two Navy officers in, in there. Sedona. In Sedona. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's great. I, that's what I love about you, Connie. The, the whole time we were together in Sedona and other times we've been together, you see the signs, you notice synchronicities, you point them out, you celebrate them. And that's why you get so many really good signs. Would you talk to people about the difference between just a, a coincidence and an actual sign? You know, 
the coincidence, a lot of times, I don't think they're coincidences. I think I always see there's an intent that it struck, it, you get snagged, and yeah. that that intent was for me and it worked, right? I don't even question. I'm just grateful I saw something. I'll be driving up to work and my mind is disengaged and I'll, I'll be thinking of different things. And all of a sudden I'll see a license plate. I'll hear a song at the exact time. There are certain songs that specifically remind me of John and uh, different people come into your lives for a reason. And I think he must have sent that person. And I, I just take it as a gift. And that's why whenever I think I see a message, I believe I see a message, it's a kiss from heaven. You know, my mom and dad come through in different ways. I just, I, I, I don't think these connections go away. We just forget, we, we don't sense them as much as we would because we're so used to sensing the physical. And I think it's learning to sense it in other ways through music and sound and light and dreams and, and meditation and prayer. I think there's different ways to feel that, to feel them, to sense yeah. them. Yeah. yeah. So you do you have a sense of John being around you often? Absolutely. I. It's interesting when I think he's, I, I used to chant in, in front of his urn, you're in me, beside me, around me. You're in me, beside me, around me. And I remember touching his urn every morning uh, in my bedroom and I would, and I can hear him say, silly girl, I'm not in the jar. <laughs> I'm not in the jar. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm everywhere and I'm helping you. And I just ask him to help me. I just ask for, you know, I ask angel guides. I, you know, my guardian angels and my parents and I just, what, what is wrong? I ask God, I ask spirit, I ask Jesus. Hey, we could use all the help we can get. And, right? it, and it helps to ask. It really yeah. does. It makes yeah. a difference. Yeah. Well, it's realizing I am powerless. I can't solve this problem. And I need some help. Would you help me out here? And We're then I'll feel kind of, we, there it is. Powerless yeah. by ourselves because yeah. we're not separate. And that's the whole point. When we realize we are part of this, this oneness, it makes all the difference. And then we turn to others for help. Mm. Yeah. So your program called Widow's Walk, what is... What are some of the main points that you make? The first chapter really begins, you get the news. And I, I condensed, you know, you get the news and then what happens next? And I, I get the visual in New England, they have the widow's walk at the top, the cupola, the top of the rooftop, where in the, in the seafaring days, your, your husband was a ship driver. The widows would walk atop it, waiting for their husbands, but before they knew they were widows, to return from the sea. And they never came home. And I thought, well, that was me on a tarmac waiting for my husband to come home. He never came home. He did come home in a casket. That was the next time I saw, I knew that, you know, he was in that. So you may not see them, but they're here. And so this journey, it's a walk. It's not a sprint. You can't delegate someone to grieve for you. You can't hire them. If you, you deny it, somehow it catches up with you. We all do our own walk. And it's a very personal way to grieve. But I always believe, you know, what's the essence of the journey? You go from we, the two of us, to me. And who is me left standing? And the hope and prayer that you are a better soul as a result of that loved one who touched you. And I think it does happen when you finally get through the, the, the sorrow, the crying, the angst, the loneliness, you are a better soul. And that, that brings joy. And that's what that life has done for you. And that's what I hope in this each episode. The first episode was, uh, again, getting the news. It was a fellow minister from Unity who was on the show with me, whose husband died after six years of cancer. She held him while he died. And, and she went through her you know, grieving. And she was a minister from Unity Spiritual. The second show was uh, my bereavement counselor, Edie Yoder who has been in, you know, has helped many people as a psychologist, as a therapist for over 40 years. So she was wonderful. The next show in this month is Death and Taxes. And it's the nuts and bolts of your husband dies. You've got the estate, you've got the wills, you've got the taxes. What happens, right? How many death certificates do you need? What do you do? I mean, so 
I have an estate attorney talking about what widows go through. And I realize, you know, one out of 10 widows is in poverty. They have nothing left behind. So hmm. what happens to them? You know, it's and, interesting when I do readings, Connie, and bring through people's spouses. Mostly it's when the husbands come through, they will show me they're so glad they had everything in order, or I'm so sorry I left you in the lurch. Yeah. Those two cases, they, they come through with accuracy because they want to apologize if they hadn't put things in order, or they just give their gratitude. That to me is evidential in itself. And it's because it's, uh, there's no way. There's no way that, that you would have known that. Yeah. There are quite a few widows who are angry, right? He never set up anything. I, I ha I'm broke. I'm totally broke. I have to raise the kids without him and they're angry. And that's mm. so hard. It's so yeah. hard. So each episode, and then towards the end of the year, because it's once a month, it talks about the widows who remarry and the widowers who remarry. I'll bring in the widowers. 61% of widowers remarry and 16% of widows remarry. Is that no, interesting? Really? Yeah. Well, men don't like to be alone. Yeah. And a lot of times the wife is the, the center of their social life. So a lot of them will remarry pretty quickly. Widows, if they're financially secure, they're fairly older, they're, they're not looking for someone to raise children. We have a saying among widows, and it's, I don't want to be a nurse. I don't want to be a purse. Oh. That's what they talk about. So I thought the nonprofit I would set up would be nurse and purse. We would help widows who are financially uh, challenged, as, as well as those who need social, emotional, financial support do that. So that's that's another project I can work on. You but never I, sit still. <laughs> well, you got to keep moving, you know? It's the creativity part. That's the fun part. You know you're doing the right thing because because you're the most alive when you're doing it. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. It's like what you do, right? And all the things you do. You retired from the military, successful military woman, and what do you do? Well, you, you never thought you'd get into passion. this, right? What would General Shelton say? <laughs> Yeah, right. so you find your passion, but I'm sure that there was a point there where you just didn't feel like doing anything. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's, I think the gift of COVID for me was after John died, I was forced to stay home and really deal with grief, knowing he'll never come home again. That would be a gift for you because I can see how you would have buried yourself in work. Mm -hmm. Distracted, you're just diverted, distracted. I needed to sit still and feel the loss. But that I realized is, that it was a loss. Even a huge piece of advice for anybody listening because COVID's over and they can go distract themselves. Right yeah, now. we are very distracted. We can't sit still without being distracted. But yeah, I always think when I get my best creative thoughts, I'm quiet. I always say, spirit doesn't shout, it whispers. It whispers to you, doesn't it? So tell me why we need to feel that grief. I think that's, you learn things of that. You learn about yourself. You realize how much you truly love that person. And I think growth comes from pain. Growth doesn't come from comfort. Growth comes from struggle and pain and it catches your attention and it shakes you up and it, it hardens you in some ways. It scars you, but it's healing the scars so you can get better and stronger. It's the only way to, well, for me, that's the only way to grow. It's, it's through pain. It's never easy. So what are the best parts? Where did you grow? When it was hard, not when it was easy. No one, no one wants that. Give it, make it tougher, right? Well, it was really tough, but you can get through it. You can get through it. And, you know, I still cry. I still cry, not every day like I used to, but I, th I think about them all the, you know, almost all the time. I'm busy with life now. And it's been how but, many years? It'll be four years, uh, July 1st. Okay, so there's no timeline. That's really important, no. isn't it? Widows grieve in their own way. There is no timeline. I have widows who were married a long time. Husbands have been very sick. I call them widows in waiting. They've been knowing their husband will pass. No. And then usually right after they die, they you know a few months later, they start dating. And their friends are appalled. And, they, and my friends say, listen, I've been grieving for eight, six to eight years. Give me a break, right? I took care of it and all this. And then I have widows who've been widowed for 10 to 15 years and they still cry, but we all grieve in our own way. We find a way to honor that love. 
but how are you? What kind of person do you become as a result, right? Who is the new me? Who's me now? Yeah. Huh. So knowing there's an afterlife, how do you feel that has changed your journey? It has made it hopeful. It has given meaning to this life I'm in. I know that when I pass, he'll come get me. He will come get me. And we, we will be together. Absolutely. But also all the others I loved, all the other family members, they're all together. My mom and dad come through. Even former presidents come through. No kidding. Yeah. Yeah. They Has come that ever happened to a medium who didn't know your background and they were surprised by a president showing up? Yes. Uh, the one in Denver who read for me in 2020, she just, she didn't know my background. And she said, you should see the lineup of souls who are grateful here, thanking you. And one of them is with John right now. I said, really, who is it? She goes, well, he's older. He is, his first name is George. But he has something to do with the Bushes. And I said, well, that's President George Herbert Walker Bush. And she looks away and she says, of course it is. He's saluting you. She doesn't know I was a rear admiral. He's saluting because he was a Navy pilot and he he was all about Navy, right? right. He would have saluted me. Well, he's just being gracious. Yes. Yeah. yeah. But I just thought it was amazing. That was is amazing. awesome. Yeah. I love that. You know, or, you know, the, the little specific, you know, one of the mediums here connected with my dad um, right after he died. This little Filipino guy died at 94, Navy steward. And she but goes, Master oh, Chief, right? Wasn't he a Master, Master Chief? Chief. The highest rank in the enlisted ranks. Uh -huh. Master Chief enlisted, right? Loves this country, was an immigrant, joined the Navy. And she goes, oh, this little guy, he's lots of energy. And he really liked Inglebert Humperdinck, didn't he? Now, how, how would she know that? Right? Because he's right there. <laughs> yeah, because my dad was there. I told my brother and sister that they're like, no, I mean, there's no way he was on the internet, Googled it, read my mind. I wasn't even thinking about music. And that was my dad who told me that. That's yeah. so awesome. Yeah. You know, you have some of the best stories. Do you have, can you pull one out of your hat? Just maybe a favorite White House story that's, that's, I know if I, I'm putting you on the spot or an Air Force One story or anything. We've been talking grieving and widows and, and afterlife, but it's so such an opportunity to have you on this show, the former White House doctor. You know, it's very humbling to look back because, you know, you look at people. I used to tell my friends, my hands have touched kings and dictators and presidents and literally and, taking yeah. care of them. Oh, yeah. I Let's see. Who's kissed my hand? Um, um, the king of Jordan before he died. Yasser Arafat kissed my hand and Juan, oh, three guys have died. Right. And Juan Carlos, who flirted with me on his yacht. Yeah, they've all been dead. They're all died. That's sort of deadly. Um, you know, it was all the the human interaction. I still remember President uh, Clinton's mother, Virginia Kelly. Virginia Kelly was a widow when she was pregnant. His father, Bill Clinton, uh, his, his Blythe was his father's name, Blythe. And so it wasn't Clinton. That was his stepdad. He took his name. So Virginia was pregnant with Bill Clinton when her husband died in a, in a car accident. He drowned and, you know, he crashed, broke his neck. So her parents helped took care, take, took care of her. So I remember when she was dying of breast cancer, right after he was inaugurated, we went to Camp David and the nurses and I were taking care of her at Camp David. And we, we had a lovely day with her at that camp. And CNN comes on and you can see her son who was in the other cabin, but there was a press brief and you can see the president. And I said, Mrs. Kelly, I because she'd remarried, I said, um, do you ever think your son would be president of the United States? Oh, she said, I did early on. I said, how did you know? She said, when he was eight years old, I sent him to the store to go get groceries. He came back with a little friend who was five and the little five-year-old was carrying the groceries and Billy didn't have anything in his hands. And I said, Billy, what's with that? Why, why are you making him do it? And he goes, mama, I figured out something. Why use this when you can use this? Oh. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But the amazing spirit and his mom and her influence on him. Um, it's, 
it's the lives that touch us that help us do the things we need to do, right? Mm -hmm. um, Just hearing those stories, it, it's, it is another world to work in that world. And the few times I was at the White House on duty with the general and then running around the Pentagon and running around the Capitol and, and having that sense of mission, it's, it just seems so far removed now from this flowy life Mm -hmm. And and knowing what we know now that we didn't know then. Well, you you were were you delving into, were you talking to mediums and psychics when you were the White House doctor? Because I had no idea the afterlife existed when I was in uniform. I didn't connect with them till after. But in the Philippines, my one of my relatives had a reading, and they said Connie would be famous in some way. And I go, what does that mean? Then I was being interviewed. And I, my sister and I in San Diego would go to this Japanese, this Chinese restaurant and all of the fortune cookies had different messages. And then I would get certain things like, you know, um, you know, you're going to Washington, D.C. There was these little fun, interesting things that would show. And it wasn't until I got interviewed because I was the one that they weren't going to pick. I was, you know, they had all these candidates who looked like Tom Cruise out of Top Gun that they were going to take that guy, not me. And. And when you mean interviewed to be the White House doctor? Yeah, yeah. My boss. Well, the story was I was I was trying to decide whether to retire or get out. My ten years was almost up, and I was making the decision that I would get out of the Navy. And that day that I picked up the papers for release from active duty to fill them out, my boss, the captain, called me and said, and he doesn't know I'm filling out paperwork to leave. And he says, Connie, I've re received the message traffic from Washington D.C. and I'm to nominate six candidates for the position of Navy White House doctor represent the Navy. We have an Army, Navy, Air Force. I want to nominate you. And I'm like, oh, no, no. I Let me ask my husband first, because we had planned I would stay in San Diego and he would make law partner and we do all that and stay there with our family. And he goes, no, no, don't do it. Forget it. You know, you know, you hate Washington, D.C. You know, it's hot and humid. The suburb, most important, they don't have good Mexican food like they do here. It's all about <laughs> there are some great criteria. Absolutely. <laughs> So then I hang up, I'm getting ready to call my boss. He goes, well, you know, on second thought, tell him yes, because you'll never get this job anyway, but it's a good resume item in case you work for Kaiser. And I thought, oh, so you really don't believe in me, do you? Wow. So I always think you you marry your biggest fan. You got to have your biggest fan. That and was your, your ex-husband, right? My, my first husband. Yeah. We were married 29 years. So I did marry my biggest fan 13 years later. That was John. But little did I know that they put my name in and I was going around the White House and I thought, oh, because I'm not going to get the job. You know, well, it was a nice tour and everything. And then I got marched into the ground floor of the White House to see Bert Lee, who was the boss. And as I get introduced, the, the, the Navy commander, Al Roberts, who was introducing me, I can hear him say, Dr. Lee, I have our next candidate for interview. And I hear this male voice say, well, did you bring her paperwork in the binder with her security clearance? And Al Roberts goes, oh, gee, I forgot it in the executive office building across the way. Then it sounded like somebody threw a book against the wall and the voice goes really gruff. Well, never mind. I'll make the decision without it. And Al pulls away from the door. He points to me, goes, you're on. And I thought, oh, great. You just upset the guy I have to interview with. So I stood up. I took a deep breath. I wiped my sweaty palms on my 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 navy my mess not my mess dress my my military my winter blue uniform, and I said a silent prayer because I've always believed in prayer, and I said, "Dear God, if this is meant to be, show me a sign." It was very simple. Show me a sign. So I walk into Bert's office, and he was about six foot two at the time, sixty three years old, very distinguished, bald gentleman. And I thought, "Oh my gosh, there's a sign." And it was a little, it was a single band-aid right across the center of his forehead. And at the time, my boys were one and three, and I was a mommy, and I thought, he's got a boo-boo on his forehead. I, I guess I should be afraid. He's human. So he shook my hand, and we launched into the interview, and I aced the interview. And a year and a half later, I had his job. Now, how does that happen? That's, that's, that's a miracle. That's meant to be. Meant to be. I was set. I really believe I was sent, right? Wow. There's a reason. Wow. Yeah. So you're continuing, you're still uh, in private practice now mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. Arizona. And 
life goes on, it's changed, but what advice do you have for people about how to, I like to tell people you don't move forward without your loved ones who have passed, you mm -hmm. move forward with them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, John's met two final messages from mediums were, this is a year and a half ago, your heart is big enough to love another. So that's one message. And the other one was, you don't need to push me away to move forward. So we'll see where that goes. Um, he will never be replaced. He knows that. But I also think people as they, as their souls evolve, have other soulmates, depending where their journey is. I have seen, in fact, today was one example. Interesting timing. I Good. did a reading for a woman who has a husband who passed. And I've seen on certain occasions like today where the husband says, I will guide to you the perfect partner. Mm -hmm. I will make sure you get somebody worthy of you. Mm -hmm. I love that. Well, I think John said that. And, and he, I would tell him my patients, I said, when my women patients lose their husbands, they grieve. When my male patients lose their wives, they replace because they, they remarry, they date right away. And John goes, I would never replace you. He says, I will die first. I said, well, you're younger than I. He says, no, I will never bury you. And I said, well, I would never remarry. He says, no, you, you need to remarry. He said, are you kidding me? I met you in my exam room. Where am I going to meet anybody? I don't date. I don't do any of that. I said, you want me to meet somebody, you send me somebody and you make it so obvious who it is because I'm not, I'm not looking. I'm fine. Right. Yeah. So now know, I know that was, I know that was a blanket statement that not all men do that. So you know, the, the replace yeah. part, the replace yeah. part, because I know we have a lot of yeah. widowers who, who are still in the deep stages of grieving here. And it's the same. I know that, Oh, I'm just now reminded of a case where a man's wife across the veil absolutely brought him and his new wife together. So mm -hmm. we're all just connected. It's all part of the, ongoing story of our lives the latter part of house calls i have couples widows and widowers who have met and remarried and they swear their spouses brought them together and that's there's such beautiful love stories one of my patients she is 87 he is 94 they got married two years ago oh they're great. the happiest they can be widow and widower that's beautiful beautiful love story well, any final words for anybody listening about the journey from we to me? Allow yourself time to grieve. It's going to hurt. It's going to be the hardest thing ever, but you will grow and you will never have to let go of your loved one. They are there. They're in the most joyful of places. If you know your loved one is joyful and happy and you'll be with them, the grieving is a personal grief. It's me in my earth form missing somebody. When we cry, when we miss them, we say, I miss you. But if you know they're happy and you'll be with them, who would not deny them that bliss? And you should be at peace with that. That is perfect. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, my dear. I found out from you, you're coming on my Alaska cruise in August. Yes. It'll be great. We get shipboard. Do we get shipboard time for that, being in the Navy? Oh, you mean sea duty time? Sea duty time. Don't we get sea pay for that? No, we don't. Get <laughs> no. No, Ty's I... going to go under the bridge and start, you know, telling the captain what to do. What do you think? He's going to go up to the bridge. No. Ty, my Ty, he, he's yeah. going to stay as far from the bridge as he can. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> he's going to enjoy himself. I'll but... go down to sick bay and say hi to the docks. I'll, well, round in sick bay. That sounds great. Yeah, so, we'll yeah. That. So if you all come on my Alaska cruise with me, you'll meet Dr. Connie. Wonderful. Yeah, have a great well, cruise. Thank you so much for joining us, Connie. I, um, um, hang on a second. I want to share one more slide with people before I say goodbye to you. Let's see if I can bring it up here. Just an announcement. I'm going to be channeling my guides for charity as we were, we, we talked about depression just briefly earlier, but my guides have actually for the first time ever told me in advance what they're going to talk about on this channeling for charity session. April 30th, they're going to address depression and mental illness from the spirit world's viewpoint. And 100% of people's contributions to attend this live event online, online are going to go to the national, what does NAMI stand for? Do you know, Connie? I can't, I mean, oh, NAMI, NAMI, National Alliance, that's it. For national Alliance for Mental Illness. For mental, for mental illness. illness. Right. 
National yeah. Alliance for Mental oh, Illness. I, yeah. I just know that they're fantastic advocates for yeah. mental illness and depression and that everybody who attends is going to help to support that. And we get to directly hear from the spirit world. I love that you're a woman of science, former a retired Navy Admiral, former White House doctor and director of the White House Medical Office. And you embrace the afterlife and talking to guides and you talk to your husband who has passed all the time. So thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for the honor of being on your show, Suzanne. Thanks for what you do to give everybody hope and joy. I can't help it. Like you said, it's our passion. It's what we yeah. do and we'll never retire. Right? That's for sure. All right. Thank all right. You. All right, everybody. Thank you for joining us. I hope you picked up some great tidbits here and, and at the very least feel inspired and filled with joy and this loving connection that we enjoy. So I will see you next time. I believe if it's not, it might be next week or the week after Bev and Lynette are going to join me. We're going to do some question and answer with the spirit world. So sign up to receive my emails on my website about upcoming podcasts, and I'll see you right back here at the next live show. Take care. Mm -hmm.